zero. And try to indicate here, I'll put you that uh, I didn't pick oxygen. Do it constantly. Just the fact that it's all blue up here, it's all red up there. But uh, and it's oxygen. One that shows uh, pure liquid in uh, chromatography, often in superficial 
fluid compact, they often, instead of using just pure CO2 as a mold phase, they lace it with some polar solid like method in various amounts to modify the polarity, which has to do with uh, stripping different things to the column. So you don't get stuck there. But nonetheless, just uh, some studies on pairing uh, the mixture of methanol and carbon dioxide in a column, 600 bar inlet, 100 <coughs> bar outlet. It's a big pressure difference. And look what happens. Pure methanol paper just goes flying. Well, liquids, nearly all of these, only uh, more of expansion because they're already crowded together. So when you compress them, um, they get more crowded. They won't expand very much. They can expand only until the pressure reaches the paper pressure. But uh, any expansion they make will drop the temperature up. But if you uh, take pure carbon dioxide, it starts <coughs> out because of the, the uh, temperature here was what was starting at some 50 degrees uh, Celsius. It starts out rising a little bit, and then maybe it just cools off a <coughs> big time, 15 degrees out. The temperature time comes up. And look at this one right here about 20%, if I'd done 19%, it would have started at 50, it would come out 50. Do you think there was a little temperature change? This is an extra taste of it. All right. Now, if you read through that uh, review, you found on the last page a little challenge. It's related to this one that I will just share with you now. If we consider ammonia gas at 150 bar and 150 degrees uh, Celsius, and here are the properties measuring those conditions. We have the, uh, the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, we have the compressibility, the, the high thermal compressibility. We have the molar volume, we have the Joule Thompson coefficient, we have the molar heat capacity constant pressure. And those are all things you can put in this equation to calculate the change in the difference in heat capacities. So that you do that. If you do, you ought to get this result, I hope, for two or they are. Also, then calculate the heat capacity constant volume, which you gave us 0.71 volume. And to calculate the ratio of heat capacity should be about 7 point three. That's the kind of thing students don't actually be able to do. So I stick this in, print that out, or scan that, and put that on the web. This afternoon. All right, so put that to rest while we.
vibrational energy in that. This, we remember, has two parts. There's always a trade-off of kinetic for potential, kinetic for potential. That's what vibration is all about. So you can't have vibration without having both kinetic and potential. Uh, so there, there are two cubby holes in translational mode. There's one each in translation. And, and, and vibration or one each in translation position. Now, classical mechanics includes uh, or embraces the equipetition theorem which we studied earlier. <coughs> now we're going to come back and revisit it in this uh, thing. And the equipetition theory, or theorem, says that equilibrium, the thermal equilibrium, all repositories for energy storage in an electric system. Uh, Share the available energy in equal positions, partition equally amongst the various places where we can simplify the body. And we, we found that worked uh, pretty neatly back when we were looking at things like, uh, like the interpretation or explanation of the new long heat rule for heat classes of metals, treated with atoms and metals, treated with oscillators, and you know, take position on that. The energy, um, the average energy of gas molecules was uh, three half kT, one half kT per, per uh, translational mode. Then we said, well, these vibrators would have one half kT per vibrational mode of kinetic energy, and one half kT per vibrational mode of potential energy, or kT per Modes, three KT, that was the efficient theory. This is revisiting that same idea. Well, let's talk about how many degrees of freedom there are in molecules. Now we're not talking about metals, metal crystals. Uh, EOL, degree of freedom of molecules, is three times the number of atoms of molecules. Everybody understand that theory of that? the number of atoms in the molecule. So here's a little table. We're going to look at uh, different kinds of atoms and count up all the degrees of freedom in, in the uh, molecule, different kinds of molecules. If the molecule had just one atom in it, it has only three degrees of freedom, and they are all translational. There's no real kind of mine. Show and tell here. There it is. You say, well, it can be rotated, yes, but that rotational part is all taken, uh, taken up in the uh, treatment of the electronic motion, not part of the, of the conversation here for the physical properties of gases. So that's very simple. So the next one is the diatomic. All right, diatomic, we have six degrees of freedom. Uh, we'll always have three of translation. And, uh, we have what? We have how many rotations? Well, we have two degrees of rotation that way or that way. So if you take this atom here and put it anywhere on the surface, it's just associated. That's the top of uh, <laughs> If you imagine this atom anywhere on the surface of a sphere, it can, be, it can reach any place on the surface of the sphere by that rotation and this rotation are a combination of just two degrees. That rotation along that axis doesn't count because that's the same as the electronic motions in this atom. Let's just <coughs> well, uh, three and two are five, so that leaves one over. That's the vibration, and of course, there it is. Now we have polyatomic with 10 greater than, uh, than two, two cases.
And uh, this has two rotations, the same as, as hydrogen, hydrogen, chlorine gas. So we have three translations, <coughs> two rotations, and how many vibrations? 3n minus 5. We have one half in the X square, that's a, the kinetic uh, energy of vibration, and one half KX square. This is not Boltzmann's constant, but rather Hooke's law constant, the elasticity of the bottom. So this is kinetic energy, and this is potential energy. theorem requires energy stored in these repositories on average be one half kT which quadratic term. So the average translational energy per mode is one half kT. The average rotational energy per mode is one half kT. The average vibration energy per mode is two halves kT. Stable one, go back here to our stable little uh, one atom molecule. The motor energy is three halves RT. There is no rotational uh, nor a vibration energy. So the total energy is three halves RT. We have engraved in our memory now that heat capacity at constant volume is partial of energy with respect to temperature and constant volume. This is the energy, so you differentiate with respect to temperature, you have three That's not just for the atom of gas, that differentiation. The capacity constant volume is partial heat with respect to temperature and constant volume. The capacity constant pressure, we just have to add R to it because it's not even gas. Three has R plus two has R is five has R. Diatomic molecules. <coughs> this will still be three as RT for the, the translational motor energy. Now we have two rotational modes and one half RT 
key for uh, mode on a motor basis. Okay. And so two others adds up the car key. We have one vibrational mode at, uh, at two halves RT per mode per mode. That does the RT. So we got three, two, two, that's seven halves RT for the total energy. Seven halves R for the heat capacity constant volume. And nine halves R for the heat capacity constant pressure. Now these multi atom molecules, more than two atoms. We have to treat these two situations separately. If the molecule is linear, like carbon dioxide, then we have the three atoms RT for translation. We have the RT, two, two rotation modes. And we have three N minus five RT for the vibrations. And add these all together, you get three N minus five halves RT for the total. You differentiate this respect to temperature, and for the deep capacity and cost of volume, it's three N minus five halves R. And for the deep capacity and cost of pressure, add R, so it's three N minus three halves. Then the last one, nonlinear molecules. Three halves RT for the translation, three halves RT for the rotation because there are three modes of rotation. Uh, three and minus six RT for the vibrations. So we add these all together and pretty clearly is three and minus three RT. Differentiate it for heat capacity cost of volume. Three and minus three R. Add R, 3N minus 2R, and then we got the table of complete. So those are the things we could easily do uh, just based on classical <coughs> inefficient theory. That's what the that, uh, classical theory predicts for these molecules when they're not packed together, so there's a lot of other stuff that we're going to all right, so I like the partition. I like to think about this partition in this way. I like to think about uh, an example of a dipot molecule. And I've drawn a little buckets or tubes that represent the places where you pour the energy. Fill them up. And, uh, so we have three <coughs> of those for translational mode, X, Y, and Z. We have two for the <coughs> rotational mode. There's one rotational mode, uh, two rotational modes. And we have two for the uh, vibrational energy, one kinetic, one potential. So here are the buttons. Here's the energy scale, and here is uh, one half kT on that scale. So we pour the energy into it and it runs out the signal level right through there. That's what it is. So it predicts for this type of molecule that the energy molecule is three halves plus two halves plus two halves kT, seven halves kT. Same thing we have in that term over there. Now we're focusing down on this one little kind of molecule. The water uh, energy of this Avogadro's number times the average molecular energy, so it's just seven halves RT. Because Avogadro's number times K is R. R. So the theory says <coughs> that for a dipole molecule, that one line for uh, the chart we had a moment ago is that the heat capacity constant volume over heat capacity is 7 halves R, the over heat capacity constant pressure is 9 halves R, and the ratio of heat capacities is 9 halves, which is about 1.285 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, isn't, isn't that CP over CV? So shouldn't it be 9, nine, over, nine over 7? Well, uh, 9 over 2. 
Yep. I had a shot of there. I don't know why. So that's the period. Now, remember about, about science. We're studying science. We're concerned with, with uh, <coughs> the observations, lots of behavior matter, about uh, trying to find rules that behavior fall and trying to interpret what is there about matter that causes this behavior. So there's some, some um, interpretation that, that cries out for some observation. How it's stacked up. All right, we will compare the efficient theory of prediction with the observed behavior for time casting. Being anything, this is the choice. And the gases are low enough pressure, so we're not having to worry about uh, having to account for the electric forces. So that's practically the pressure. I'm going to look at some properties and compare the nutrition theory with the experimental result for nitrogen gas and uh, the molar energy. The theory says it should be 7 halves RT or 3.5 RT. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's right. Well, the heat capacity cost of volume then is the derivative of, of uh, the energy. So theory says it should be 7 halves R, 3.5 R, and it's 2.503 R, which is about 5 halves R. And the ratio of heat capacity, so theory says it should be, thank you. Uh, 9 over 7. I got it. Okay. Okay. Right.
that uh, we, human beings, scientists, uh, we think we're more than nature is endowed us to be. And we feel we should be able to see the universe, uh, see the world as it actually is. But we're, we cannot, cannot do that. It is not in the planet today. We cannot do that. So, for example, suppose that we wish to, uh, to uh, locate a park. Locate this pink. How do we go about doing that? It's a dark picture. So we had to go around. We had to interact with the object. But I had to do it. It was lying here. What do we say? It's a lie. Counts it off it. Bounce back to our eyes. In general, if you try to locate a particle, you have to send a messenger that is responsive to its presence and can report back to us that it had an encounter to suggest there was a lot there. And that's, that's who we are, and that's the limited information. Um, and there's no way that we can and locate uh, that particle without interacting with it and without interacting with it in an energetic way, and perhaps even disturbing it, changing it. So the truth is that observations are always perturbed the particle in some indeterminate way and leaves it different than when we found it. Now, some years ago, you were probably known as you were born then. Some years ago, we said some fine young men often to uh, rendezvous with them. I remember that much. Very exciting. They had to travel the distance through space, not just the 220,000 miles to move, but they had to go on a two big path. And they were pretty confident when they got there. And they looked out the window that they were so moved. And that's a particle. And we observe it, but we don't knock it out and sort of it out so we can't land a spaceship on it. So why is it particle is more of a common study of chemistry? Why is it something like an electron? We're trying to find electrons. Then what do we have to do? We, we can't see it with ordinary light. We have to interact with it somehow. And any observation we make on that electron, we did right here, this place, Angel, and we did something that came back and said, oh, there's an right there. Uh, we say, oh, yeah, but you can't be sure they should go back and find it there. can't you go back and look? It's not there. this reason, we need to uh, give fair consideration to two questions, which I'll now ask. And uh, I'm sure you know the answer. <coughs> Can a particle, any particle, or even like that, or some electron, so far, can a particle be at rest? Anybody agree with that? No. You say no? No. Anybody else? Everybody agree? We take a vote. No. That's the party line. And I say to you, in all sincerity, hell yes! Why not? Who the hell are we to, to tell the particle that it can't be less than? That is the arrogance of the human being. Slave God, which I told you we do when we create theories. On our theory, we can say our model molecule has to be moving or whatever. But we're talking about real matter now. 
not talking about the deep. That's the arrogant nature of who we are. Teach people like you, people all over the world, that the powerful cannot be oppressed. And I'll say be yes. Prove it. There's, there's no reason to have a student. No reason at all, other than just to preserve our dignity. <coughs> what we think is our dignity. So I would say, uh, say yes, uh, the powerful can be addressed. I, far I know, I don't know reason why it can't be. And then the next question is, can we observe a particle to be addressed? And what's the answer to that? We haven't thus far. Pardon? <laughs> said we haven't thus far. I'd say can we. Based on who we are. And the answer is no. We cannot observe parties being blessed. Why? Because we're human beings. We're not gods. We're human beings. And the only way we can locate a particle is by interacting with it. And if we interact with it once and disturb it in some way that we've not got certain details of it and go there and and interact with the second time, different time, and say, oh, it was here then, it's here now, time difference, we know it's going this direction, this speed, you say, oh, yeah, well, then we predict there's going to be out there, you go out there at that time, but it's not there. Why? Because each observation talks it all the force. Each observation changes into something determined. We can't know. Could it be at rest? Oh, hell yes. Could we find it there? If we found it once, Water the crew is at rest, we had to go find it there again. And if it's not there, we say it wasn't at rest. Why do you know what? It was. Well, what I would like you to think about, try to understand, is that because of who we are and the limitations on our ability to uh, determine the behavior of matter, especially small TV pieces of matter, like the electrons and atoms. Because of who we are and the uncertainty in where these particles are and how they are moving, the uncertainty to us, not to them, not to a god, but to us or any creature with our limited powers of observation, not to discern. We must build into our models that actually. Having to do that leads to trouble. Leads to this trouble. And lots and lots of others. So we need to build into our models the very basis of our limitations certainty of uh, where things are and how they are moving. Now, does that make sense? That seems a reasonable thing. Is there a way to do that in an open and honest and defensible manner? And the answer is absolutely yes. An honorable, open, honest, defensible manner. Why then is it never ever done that? Oh, but I suspect that it's just the arrogance of, of our species that in order to preserve what we think is our lack of dignity, 